to show yes, there's, uh, no, there is no road drop. Good. Um, there was the rush through at least about a few of my favorite arguments why photons are a nice system. But now we jump into stuff that we'd like to talk about in more details about recent results. So now we go back to the region of quantum physics, OK? No computing, just curiosity. And we were interested in testing, is the mathematics the right one that we use for describing quantum physics? So what do you mean by that? As you might remember, back in the days, um, quantum physics was developed hand in hand with the development of mathematics. Heisenberg developed also matrix formalism and so on, OK? And remarkably, the, the smart mathematicians at that time realized, even though we have not developed this new, beautiful mathematical framework, we still have problems and issues with quantum physics, OK? Nowadays, we all know there's this randomness, which is still hard. But now we accept it. But at that time, it was something people didn't like, OK? Measurement problem and so on. So as the new mathematics showed up, people like von Neumann um, realized that even though we have not this beautiful new mathematics that allows to describe the entire quantum physics, we still have an issue that we can still not uh, predict with certainty the result of a measurement outcome, for example. Okay? So here is the fair question. Guys, maybe you use the wrong mathematics. Okay? Maybe quantum physics works nicely, and you just have the wrong toolbox in your hand. So that's basically here the, the summary that he defined. He said, well, if you work in the Hilbert space, you have the freedom to choose what kind of numbers you take. Real numbers, in fact, you can use real numbers, but then you have issues to describe some kind of uh, properties. You take complex numbers, the things we're used to since high school, they work nicely, OK? But there's high, there are higher classes, so-called quaternions with four elements, or octanions with eight elements. They also allow a full framework uh, of so-called rays in the Hilbert space, OK? So he asked the question, what about if you take basically a more complex mathematical framework, can we solve problems then, OK? So what are the next, uh, the next level of mathematics there, the so-called quaternions? In principle, they're the same as complex numbers, but just they have three imaginary parts. You see, that's a quaternion number, one real, and here the three imaginaries. And they also have been defined by Hamilton back in the days as a full mathematical framework. What's the difference to, to complex numbers? The difference is that they do not commute, OK? So we are used with complex numbers, 5 times 3 is the same as 3 times 5. Quaternions, it's not the case, OK? So mathematics slightly has different issues there. Well, of course, this means when you think about making experiments and trying to investigate if mathematics is right, then it was pointed out by, by Perez that, in fact, you can do experiments where you might see different results if mathematics is based on quaternions who do not commute or complex numbers who commute. Okay? So you basically thought about um, um, experiments where you see basically phase shifts from two elements where A and B is not the same as B times A. Okay? And that's basically his pioneering work. Now comes an important issue. Okay? When we talk about um, commuting behavior, it's not the phase shift of 5 and 7 pi. It's basically the quaternic number, which is given by the mechanism of the material, how it interacts with the light. Okay? So in other words, to have different complex or quaternic numbers, you want to have different physical mechanisms okay, that basically make light, for example, interact with something. So the, the key challenge was here to define basically different quaternic numbers that originate from different interactions of light or phase shifters with light. Okay? So if you have different, inter different mechanisms, different quaternic numbers, then you can make a test if A times B is the same as B times A and compare complex numbers versus um, quaternic numbers. The first people who were interested in that that time were neutron guys, okay? And they built precisely this kind of experiment. So they've done a Marzender, they built a Marzender, which is like entrance beam splitter, output beam splitter, mirrors here. If the neutron comes, it's superimposed to go either the upper path or the lower path, recombined, and then it goes out to this port and that port. As you remember, by choosing the phase shift in there, you can choose which output port has been taken, all the neutrons here or there. The two elements that were taken to have different, to test is mathematics right or wrong, uh, are basically di were required to be very different in interaction. And indeed, they found two materials which have very different properties, one with a so-called positive scattering amplitude, the other one with a negative scattering amplitude. Very different mechanism how neutrons see this material. And they've done an experiment. They said, OK, let's see if they commute or not commute. Uh, nothing in there, so they changed in the, with some mirror at the fringes. 
and they've seen fringes with nothing, fringes with just one element, the other element, then they compared AB, aluminum and titanium, and BA, okay? And they said, is there any difference? If there's no difference, complex numbers, difference, quaternions. And they've seen no difference, up to this little noise level in there. What's the problem? And good for us. The problem was they couldn't see anything, okay? So when I take a closer look at this mathematics, it turns out that for, um, for non-relativistic, <coughs> i.e. massive particles, regular Schrodinger equations, the amplitudes dumps exponentially. In other words, you cannot see an effect if you have massive particles. So you have to go to a framework of, non of relativistic things and massless things like photons, our business, where we actually could say, well, now we test properly if there's something out there uh, that we can see is there some, some noise that might come from quaternionic, quaternionic contributions. So what we have done was precisely that. We took different phase shifts, A, B, and compared this A, B the same as B, A, and that's basically the sketch of such an interferometer we have done there, okay? Light comes in, one element and the other, but I have a few more slides to show in more detail what we have done out there. Um, so we have taken for stability reason a folded Marzena, which is so-called Sanyak loop because the arms compensate themselves if there's noise. So how does it go? Light comes in there, it goes 50-50 beam splitter, either this path or that path, and everything is aligned properly. Then you have interference that all the light must go out there and nothing comes out of this port. It's so-called dark port, okay? So what defines the light that comes out there? Very simple. So there's no light coming out if this term is one, that means the visibility is perfect, and you have perfect interference, and you have no contribution from this gamma, which is the quaternionic contribution, okay? So the test, of course, you have to make the visibility as good as possible, that we have no noise, otherwise you would see no signal from the noise floor, and then we could really test if this, this, term, if this term is basically existing or not. So just sitting there and comparing, are there any clicks, and do they get the clicks higher or lower, it's not the best way to check something. You want to have a basically a tunable parameter. So what have we done? So we added here another Marzenda, you see this one here, where the change of the mirror leads to fringes down there. Very simple to understand. If nothing comes out there, best case, then light just comes here. You tune the mirror, it stays flat. It's basically as if, as if there is no light. If some light comes out there, then you see little wiggles coming up and the little wiggles get bigger and bigger, the more light sneaks out there and you can really have a controlled basically a fringe visibility telling you what's happening in there. So we compared them with different elements here and there, similar to neutron guys. What's the challenge? I'm a little proud about that. The challenge was to find materials that interact in a different way with light. And that's not that easy, because the normal thing where you get a phase shift from light is by refringence, no? It gets slower in some uh, thicker material, okay? So that's one, one mechanism. Then we looked for some other mechanism, how we can basically have a very different interaction with light, similar to the neutron guys, like, for example, positive and negative scattering length. The thing we had in mind then was to use a so-called negative reflective index material or metamaterial, okay? The way how light interacts with metamaterials is totally different, okay? It's artificial antennas as with, um, as with the liquid crystals. Therefore, we assume there must be different quaternions, and here we might see uh, basically a strong effect if something is out there. Good. Um, what I'm, well, let me not go into details here. Metamaterials, are, you know, are those things which allow this um, cloaking or uh, which give it this negative phase shift by having negative permittivity and permeability by using these kind of antenna structures. Um, if you would have a liquid out of metamaterials, it would look like this, okay, whereas normal liquid bends the straw like that, okay, really like very, very interesting properties. We haven't done those ourselves, but we got a very lucky situation that we uh, got in touch with the Zhang group in Berkeley, who at that time made the first metamaterials working for our visible light, okay? Normally they are far off in the, in the wavelength, they did something for us, and it was also the best quality so far because they worked with single photons, they wanted to test quantum physics, and they were not used to have very low losses in there, okay? So we said, please, we fight for every photon, make the best, and we got good devices that were in the order of 50% in the beginning. The experiment took so long, or we took so long, that they oxidized a bit and they went down to effectively 10, 13% at the end. Good. That's the experiment. You see we have here, these are the metamaterials. We see a negative phase shift with respect to different wavelengths. We, we state normally at 800. 
and you see a positive phase shift for regular liquid crystals, which is the same as a piece of glass, okay? Very, very basic interactions. Good, now we need quantum systems, so we took a single photon from a, so a down conversion source, two photons come out, one is a trigger, other photons sent into here this uh, sun jacket of a meter, one element is metamaterial, other element is, is, the, is the liquid crystal, with that we really could um, investigate the story. We got different fringes for nothing in there, A in there, B in there, and both. We zoom in a bit, so you see basically these are the real wiggles. When you zoom in, you see this kind of uh, better resolution. The summary of the story is that we observed that up to this 0.03 degrees, we don't see anything, okay? So at least it was a factor of 10 better than neutrons, plus based on relativistic particles, which have a chance to see the effect. So I personally believe there is no reason to build something up with quaternions. There was a hype many years ago to use those because they're very handy. As you can imagine, these four elements is something immediately that jump into your eye when you think about tensors or general relativity. Three for space, one for time. So people tend to use those um, as a very handy mathematics. But here it seems that um, complex numbers are still very fine and there's no, at least up to this little noise level, no strong indication that we have the wrong mathematics, okay? But at the end, we have to test. You know, we never know, and sometimes this little epsilon of uncertainty might open a new door, okay? So here, but that was our, our approach. Good, oops, how much time do you have? So now, the are supposed to, do you still have about 10, 15 minutes? Okay. Good, now we change gears, okay? The only thing is the same as the setup, more or less, in terms of concept, but now we jump to interesting computations, and I would like to show you how uh, by changing the, the framework, you can even boost regular quantum computers, okay? So that's the story here. Um, by changing what is superimposed, you might, might be surprised what can be done with respect to standard quantum architectures. Good. The story starts basically with the investigation that people said quantum mechanics allows to superimpose everything, okay? Normally we're used to superposition of states and so on, but in principle you can also superimpose orders or causal causality or basically causal orders. So what, what are causal orders? We're used to them from the very early days of our life. A comes before B or A affects B in one way or other around B affects A in one way and there's a time flow, these errors. Sometimes they could be also a common cause that um, twin birth gives A and B, something like this, okay? We're used to that. And we go to quantum mechanics where we like to superimpose things because that's the interesting stuff that's not out there for, for classical physics. So now we superimpose states, we're used to them, no? Zero and, zero and one, spin up, spin down, polarization states, and so on. But in principle, you're also allowed to superimpose here, so causal orders, okay? There's nothing that's against that. You can see that basically you're not an, you don't know who comes first, for example, in this case. When you be like a computer guy, you say, wait a second, causal actions or causalities also in gates, no one gate before the other. So you can think about superimposing this kind of transformation or gate actions in the same way. In the bigger picture, you can feel the thing of a standard of a quantum computer where in principle quantum physics allows to superimpose the order of gates. Sorry. Gates, but also causal relations. Sorry? Yes. Is it state Yes, but, but with the causal relation, it's, it goes beyond the regular state, so there's time dependence. You can superimpose time orders. So it's time for your state, depends how you define it. Okay? You, you want to test time ordering? Yes, you can do that, yeah. Superimpose. At least you can, you can have superposition at the end, you do not know who was first, okay? So that's, that's a rather new field where a few groups jump on that because it's interesting to, to think about the time flow, which always considered as one basic particular trajectory, can be also superimposed. At the very end, you can say, I don't know who was first, as in quantum physics. I just see particular interference that tells me there was this superposition of causal orders, okay? So mapping it down to applications, okay, which is the case which I would like to talk today, but it goes far beyond that. You can think about, wait a second, we can superimpose gate orders of computers. That is different to regular standard, to all the standard quantum computer architectures because, as you remember, the speed up for computers come from having superimposed zero and ones, input states, yeah? massive parallelism. Then you basically have to fix gate orders that do the job you like to do, a shore, a grover, who are smart architectures who basically knock down the wrong results and give you only the right one, okay? 
but the gate order is fixed. You don't change the circuit, basically. Now you're allowed to superimpose different circuits in a way that you have, at the same time, different architectures used at the same time, in addition to having here this massive parallelism because you can still use zero and ones at the same time, okay? That's the new idea out there. So let's take the simplest case and you will see what's suddenly interesting, how you can basically do something better. So the simplest case is you have a control bit and a target bit and the control bit, if the control bit is in the state zero, you have the order of first this operation and then this one, you see, it blooms. Or you have the state one, then you have the other, op other operations first, this one and the other one. Two different cases, very distinguished, very, very, very distinguishable. And you can write it down like this, of course. So when you superimpose the control bit, then of course you have superposition of u1, u2, or u2 and u1 as written there, okay? And this is something that was developed a couple of years ago, and it says mathematics and quantum physics allows to do so. So the question is, why the heck should you care, okay? One reason is, well, you can do things faster. It was shown that with such a superstition of gate orders, you can, for example, by asking only once, going through the gate only once, tell them, do the commute or anti-commute, okay? That was the beginning, and here it was shown already there is a speed up. People try to find other applications that go beyond that. So by having one shot only, you know, do the commute or anti-commute by seeing either this port or that port gives a click. Here's the summary page, so if you don't need to listen to all the stuff, but it's that summary page why these causal suppositions are interesting. First of all, to show a linear advantage with respect to standard quantum computer architectures. In other words, they're faster than what you have seen so far from standard circuit model or measurement-based models and so on. And they're super interesting in investigating um, uh, causal orders and the relation to that because they might shine new twists or new insights how time, quantum physics, up to even general, general relativity might interact because you're allowed to superimpose time flows and causal relations, okay? Active field is not, not clear picture yet where this will end, but it's, you will see, I guess, every month interesting papers uh, using this kind of concept out there. So these are the two uh, driving forces why this is interesting um, at the moment. Good, let's go to experiments. We like to see it in reality. You want to see on the optics table, this is really happening. So what we need to do, we have to build something that, that allows to do that. So photons, again, very nice. Mobility, key issue. We can do something nicely. So the simplest way to do it is to take uh, two operations, u1, u2, and you take photons which um, take polarization as the degree of freedom to tell them where to go. So if they're horizontally polarized, if this polarizing beam splitter, they go just straight. Uh, so let's show it like this, okay, maybe lack of time. If the H polarized, they go straight, first here, H goes straight through, up here, H goes straight through, then this and out. If they're vertically polarized, then this device reflects the light. So you start with this one first, up here, reflect again here and out. So you see the polarization defin defines the order. And if you know, superimpose the polarization, which is very easy, you just turn a wave plate. Then you have superposition of U1, U2, or two U1, two U2 and U1 as written here. In the computational language, people call this a switch, okay? So that's a, with two operations, a two-switch gate, and people will draw it like this. The control bit defines basically how the switch basically acts on the operations, okay? That's basically the computer language to that. <laughs> so we have done this. So we have control and target was put into one photon. Again, nice advantage of photons. You can use more degrees of freedom. So the path set, one direction is zero, other one is one for the control bit, and the polarization, the intrinsic spin of the photon was used as basically where the computation takes place. What do I mean? So that's a beam splitter who says, if the photon comes here, it's in a one state, if it comes there in a zero state, or it's superimposed, it goes basically uh, superimposed, uh, in a superimposed way, these kind of paths. Then we basically folded them like this, and folded them like that, and then we recombined the beam splitter in the same way as shown before with the PBS. It's really identical to that. So now I put in the two operations. As a first case, we just use uh, some transformations or polarization rotations. And by basically building that, you could really have with one shot only superposition of this for that or that for this operation, which allowed by one shot only to check do they commute or not commute, okay? Similar setup as before. Uh, down conversion, two photons, one is trigger, other photon goes in there, enters the beam splitter, and then defining on the ratio here, you go this path, and out, or that path and out. So my fingers are not that good, so I use these pointers here. So here comes the photon, superimposed, it goes 
either this order or that order, and then again recombines here at the end and comes out. By one shot only, in other words, by going through each gate only once, you can check the commutator or if the commute or not commute. Here comes the we have tested this in the experiment. Okay, we've chosen unitaries that are commuting or not commuting. Again, the question to you guys, uh, how good do you remember 101 in quantum physics? So we've chosen in the beginning very simple operations, okay, Pauli operations, yeah, you know, X, Y, Z. So question to you, when you have now, for example, X and Y Pauli operators after each other, do they commute or not commute? Please. Not commute, okay, so they go out to, one, to port blue, you see? Right. If you have now, for example, X and X, they commute red. So you see, at least from the basic knowledge that we have, the experiment works, you can see, yes, commuting here, green, not commuting blue. Then we took other operations, basically very weird unitaries, you also can see commuting with respect to each other. We could see that we get also this very nice one shot only result, being commuting and not commuting over there, which cannot be done by a standard quantum computer, okay? That was the story here. Good. Um, last three minutes, I see, probably. i make it short, so I will rush for the slides. So the, last, the next step that was interesting to us was, are we really sure that we have this causal superposition? Because so far, I just entertain you with that. But people could say, wait a second, Philip. You see a speed up, fine, okay? That's something a standard computer cannot do. But is this really convincing that you have superposition of causal structures? Because at the end, you might have found a better algorithm, okay? And still have this kind of classical world scenario that there's a superposition of, of orders. Well, fair enough. So the way to convince ourselves and others we do have the superposition of causal orders was to take a witness, and basically the witness violates, if it's above zero, it's really basically a superposition of causal orders or non-separable case. If it's below zero, bad for us, um, then, there's not, then, then this is not the case. Identical to entanglement witnesses, years ago, they also have basically a fingerprint that says, yes, that's a belt pair or not, or that's a cheat C state or not, okay? It was the same concept here. It just takes a few measurements out there. Good, so the story is now done in a process matrix, in a matrix, but it's in the process, it requires process matrix, where you choose different input states, different settings for the operations, and output here. The nice thing is like, you can imp implement any operation here, then here. You can even make measurements and so on. You can superimpose measurement results, okay? Quantum physics allows to do everything. So, there's details, basically, we, we, there's a process matrix, I don't need to tell this you. Uh, the question was, can we can basically define case, can we prove that it's either separable in like this way that basically it really says, oh, I'm A before B or B before A, there's no coherence in between them. Can we basically prove that? Yes, we found an operator similar to entanglement witness that applied to the process matrix is the following, if it's bigger than zero, we have a separable case, boring case, if it's smaller than zero, we say yes, fingerprint, you are in superposition of causal relations. Now I rush through because of time. Um, the point is now, this slide, so we've done many measurements, many input states, and many settings for this measurement operation, for these operations here. The challenging part of this experiment was really a beast to do so, okay? Was the fact that he replaced the unitary operation with a measurement device. Really put in something that's brutal. You know, measurements are brutal in quantum physics. Now random, they give you zero and one. He put this inside. The tricky part was that it doesn't destroy everything is, that the result of the measurement operation here stays inside the box. Nobody knows the answer until the very end, okay? So let me phrase it more mathematically. So basically, we have basically here this kind of uh, probabilities to get, which allowed us to reconstruct the witness, which defined on the input state here. It says superposition of the control bit go both ways, or just one or the other. Measurement settings here of, of Sorry, measurement A, measurement settings here and reparation of the outcome. And here we just took the unitary operations as before. So the beast, of course, was to put in here this measurement operation uh, inside the interferometer. So it had built an interferometer inside the interferometer, which was like not that straightforward. That's the picture. Um, so previously we had just these unitary operations acting on the polarization. Now we put in this kind of beam splitter uh, or polarizing beam splitter where Photon is either H comes out here or V comes out there with reparation operations afterwards. But then you see it doesn't leave the circuit, it stays in here. So this result is recombined here also and goes out here. 
And the other result stays inside and the medically stable and goes out uh, there, okay? So now we had, the point is now we had two more outputs, okay? Fair, as you can do that. But the point is the measurement result is not known to the outside until here. But then end of the day, we are able to superimpose all the measurement results. Good. That's the result of our witness. Uh, that's the quality of the setup. If the visibility is perfect, you've done a good job. That as you really stay in, in a good regime, then you can see you violate. So we flip the plus and minus sign, but basically, if you be above zero, you have this proof that you are in superposition of causal relations. If you be at one, then you be up to this value of 0.2. We never have one in reality, so we're more like 1.9 something. So that was the best value we got with this number here. And then to show that it's really like. Um, uh, the case that we see, I wanted to, again, we like to touch knobs. And we want to touch a knob and see how things change. So what can you change here? We on purpose misalign the setup to get basically to, to allow nature more and more to understand what's happening inside. So when it degrees the quality of your interferometer, which is basically this axis, you go from one to zero, then of course the witness gets smaller and smaller. And at this point here, of basically being 70% quality visibility in your setup, you get results that could be also explained by just regular classical causal relations, no supposition, okay? We like to have this kind of plot because it really shows that um, it, it makes sense what we are doing. You want to really have not only one shot measurements, but you want to see basically correlations or basically how one thing affects the other one. Okay, the highest number was 0.2 with up to, I don't know, five, six standard, standard deviations for our case. Good, before I get kicked out here, the last slide. So um, besides the personal view about photons, why I think they are nice and will have a very good future uh, for applications, I showed you recent results that we have done and we like to, uh, first of all, investigate this kind of um, mathematics of quantum physics, comparing complex number versus quaternions. And then I jumped over to interesting new twists in quantum physics that allow to superimpose gate orders. Uh, we've seen we can have um, um, speed ups with respect to standard architectures, and also have shown that, that basically we, we could find a witness operation to really prove uniquely yes, it's the case that you have this kind of superposition in the box. They also superimposed a measurement operation in there. I would like to go along if, if in this um, framework. Um, there are many things to do. Uh, it turns out there are more applications. It was shown communication can be done better. There's new ideas for, for investigating um, computational speed ups. And of course, we like to think about foundations. Basically, can we really have uh, weird suppositions of causal relations where with active switches and so on that might twist our brain even more what quantum physics allows to do so. Um, good. Um, I'm just showing off with results that I haven't achieved myself. So that's the team who stands behind the experiment. Particularly, I want to mention uh, Lorenzo, who's done, who's done the metamaterial business, and Julia and Lee, who works, who's still working on the superstition of causal relations, and they basically really dig into there and, and have done the, the great job. If that, I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.